Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to the LSE for this online event named Infrastructure in Latin America from the Investment Gap to Spending Efficiency. This event is hosted by the LSE Latin American Caribbean Center and the LSE Latin America Alumni Associations. My name is Carlos Nascimento and I'm the LSE Custom Programs Representative in Brazil, coordinator of the MBA in Public-Private Partnerships and Concessions, the MBA PPP, and currently also president of the Brazilian LSE Alumni Association. I hold a Master of Public Administration degree from the LSE. I'm very pleased to be here to welcome three billion women uh, to the LSE today. Uh, Mrs. Marianne Fay, Antonella Bancalari, and Patricia Pedia, who I will present properly quite soon. But before we start the event, I would like to invite our two hosts for the opening remarks. Firstly, I would like to invite Professor Garrett Jones. Garrett is director of the Latin American Caribbean Center, as well as a professor of urban geography in the Department of Geography and Environment at the LSE, and an associate member of the International Inequalities Institute. He has an inter interdisciplinary academic background, having studied economics, geography, and urban sociology, and holds an undergraduate degree from the University College London and a doctorate from the University of Cambridge. He has held numerous visiting positions, including at the University of California, San Diego, the University of Texas at Austin, and the University of Ibero-Americana. Professor Jones, the word is yours. Okay, thank, thanks, Carlos. Uh, welcome, everybody. I hope everybody is, is well and safe wherever you are. Um, it's a great pleasure to uh, introduce this or co introduce this, uh, this event. Um, I have a prejudicial in, interest in uh, infrastructure in Latin America, so um, this uh, is, is great for me, and I hope it will be great for everybody uh, as the sort of session um, develops. It's particularly important. Um, for me as the director of the Latin America and Caribbean Center as well at the LSE um, to develop this collaboration with the alumni associations. Um, we've been talking about this for many months and many years. Um, distance has always to some extent defeated us. Now events uh, have enabled us, um, unfortunately in one way, uh, to sort of develop this closer if virtual um, bond uh, and to develop this event together. And it's great to see um, uh, so many kind of uh, friends and names I recognize coming up on my screen uh, as well. Um, if you want to find out a little bit about the Latin American and Caribbean Center, uh, please look to our, our website. You'll find some details there about our newsletter. Um, but for those of you more accustomed to social media, uh, we're on Twitter, we're on Facebook. Uh, 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 etc. So uh, please uh, follow us in uh, the accustomed manner. Um, as I say, I hope that this is the sort of first of a number of events that we can develop with uh, the alumni associations. Thank you to all uh, the country presidents uh, for making this possible. Uh, and I think what we have is a responsibility both from here uh, and from where you all are to sort of develop a dialogue around the larger challenges uh, and to examine and address uh, those challenges as they kind of influence and affect the region, uh, but also bring that knowledge and that understanding into the sort of LSE ecosystem, uh, whether that's understood as uh, the, uh, the London postcode uh, or our wider uh, international uh, networks. Um, I'd like to pass the microphone on now, if I may, to Felipe. Uh, who's president of the Columbia Alumni Association. Felipe, to you. Uh, good morning to, to everyone. And in the name of all the alumni associations of Latin America, absolutely all of them, a warm welcome to, to all the, the participants and, and to all the people that have joined. I also happen to be the regional ambassador for the region, uh, which is kind of a facilitating role, a coordinating role with the Central Committee of Alumni. So this is an absolute pleasure to, to open this event. And ironically, this initiative came about uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, we started to talk uh, with all the presidents of the other associations uh, in Latin America, 
and actually Gareth uh, and Andres Velasco and and uh, and the the alumni association put us together to discuss ideas, alternatives, things that we could move forward. And this is the first of many initiatives uh, that we're putting forward. And uh, infrastructure is important for the for the region. Uh, and I think that the presentations today will will show how important is government spending during times of pandemic. Uh, probably governments are the only ones left with money to invest. So we have to make sure that these investments are done intelligently and more importantly, that are sustainable in, 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 the, long, in the long term. So again, uh, welcome. Uh, this is a, an event that we're very proud of. And again, is the first of many initiatives that we will do together with all the other associations in Latin America. So without any further delay, please go ahead and, and start the forum. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Garrett. Thank you, Felipe. I would also like to thank our friends from uh, Columbia University. They also supported this event. Uh, so now what I would, would like to do is to introduce you to our guest speakers today. Uh, I will start with Marianne Fay, an economist specializing in sustainable development. She is the World Bank Director for Bolivia, Chile, Ecuador, and Peru. She has 25 years experience in different regions of the world, contributing to knowledge and on in the search for development solutions in the areas of infrastructure, urbanization, climate change, green growth, and poverty reduction. Ms. Fay is a U.S. French binational who earned her PhD in economics from Columbia University. She's especially interested in the convergence between economic growth and environmental sustainability as key components of prosperity and the future of the countries and their citizens. Thank you very much, uh, Marianne Fay, for accepting speaking today. It's a great honor to us. It's a great honor to us to host here Antonella Bancalari. Uh, she's a research associate at the Institute for Fiscal Studies and a PhD candidate at the LSE. She's also a consultant at Inter-American Development Bank on Health and Social Protection and a research fellow at Redes Peru. She will be joining the, the, the School of Economics and Finance at the University of St. Andrews from January 2021 as an assistant professor. She's an applied microeconomist and her, her research sits in the intersection of development, public and health economics. She uses applied econometrics and field experiments to understand the principles underlying effective public, public service delivery. In the past, Antonella has worked in the public sector consultancy and in fact evaluation in several countries in Latin America, Southeast Asia, and Africa. Antonella holds a master in public administration from the LSE and a BCC, BSc in economics from Universidad del Pacifico, Lima, Peru. Thank you very much also Antonella for being with us today. And finally, I would like to introduce you to Patricia Pedia. She is a seasoned infrastructure manager with a particular focus on public-private partnerships, PPPs, private sector development, transparency, and institutional audit in emerging markets. Over the last 16 years, she's led the planning, design, appraisal, implementation phases, and performance, performed the institutional audit of a wide range of investment projects and PPPs from the perspective of both the, public, the private and the public sectors. Patrice is currently a lecturer on the PPP Diploma Program for Public Officials in Latin America, now in second edition. Uh, this program is run by CAF, the Development Bank of Latin America. And she's also a PPP consultant at the International American Development Bank, working on regional Latin project. Mr. Ms. Peja holds an MSc in Social Policy and Development, development from the London School of Economics and Political Science. So thank you very much uh, to you three. So uh, what do we discuss today in this lecture? Latin America has, has the second lowest rates in infrastructure investment as a share of GDP among developing regions, less than 3% compared to 4 to 8% elsewhere. So how do we overcome this? For a long time, the infrastructure narrative su su suggested that if a region underperforms on infrastructure, it has to spend more. However, in recent years, many multilateral development banks and other multilateral institutions like the UNES and the IMF have advocated 
that the focus should be on service gap rather than a notional and larger hypothetical investment gap. To the question of how much is needed, the response should be for what. In this event, we will debate a paradigm, paradigm, paradigm shift, how to transition from spending more to spending better. We will highlight a path that helps the region move from structures to service and improve infrastructure for all. I just remember for those Twitter users in the audience, the hashtag for today's event is uh, hashtag infrastructure Latin. This online event is being recorded and will hopefully be made available as a podcast subject to, the, to no technical difficulties. We also make the, make the speaker's presentations available to the audience. As usual, there will be a chance for you to put your questions to the speakers. To submit your questions, please use the chat function. Questions will be submitted to myself and I will post as many as possible to the speakers. Please let us know your name and affiliation. We are particularly keen to hear from our students, alumni and incoming students, so please let us know. Please also direct your questions to the specific speaker you want to get a response. So now I'm delighted to hand over to Ms. Marianne Fay. Marianne, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And let's see if I can figure out how to uh, share my screen. Yeah, okay. Can you... Um, let me see. Can you guys see that? If somebody yes. could wave and say, yeah, all how, good. Okay. How good. Great. Thank you very much for this introduction. I'm really delighted to be here. I, Columbia and LSC are two institutions I'm very fond of. I, uh, I almost went to the LSC, but then in the end went to Columbia. So both of them are, are institutions I've also worked a lot with. Um, look, I think you, you gave a very nice introduction. And I think that I, what I want to present today is some work that I did about with some colleagues about a year and a half ago. Uh, that sprung from the general frustration we had in the G20 dialogues and many dialogues where what we were constantly be hearing, oh, Latin America should invest 4% of GDP or X percent of GDP, but nobody, those numbers were pulled out of a hat. And, you know, fundamentally, we really wanted to make the point that how much you need to spend depends on what you want to achieve, as well as how efficient you are in getting there. So. We, what we did was to try to do a very systematic effort. We looked at five infrastructure sector, I think uh, transport, energy, uh, water and sanitation, irrigation and flood protection. And we looked at them in a very consistent manner instead of just pulling numbers from different reports. And we generated thousands and thousands of scenarios to try to understand what were the drivers of cost. Um, and the scenarios were based on, on you know, uh, high ambition, uh, what we thought was a reasonable set of, of goals, which was essentially the SDGs as well as, as, well as, um, as uh, putting the countries on the path to climate stabilization, and then a, a low ambition scenario. So what are the findings of this? Well, um, in terms of the investment needs, it varies from two to eight percent of GDP, depending on the goals and the efficiency, right? So, so anybody who gives you a single number about, you know, how much should be invested, you really have to ask them what are the goals and what is, is assumptions they're making about the efficiency. Um, the second thing is that with the right policies, it would be possible to achieve the uh, SDGs and stay on track to full de decarbonization with only 4.5% of GDP for emerging economies and developing countries in general. The equivalent amount for Latin America is 3.3% of GDP, so a little bit lower. The, sorry, yeah. Okay, so how does that work? So in terms of the energy sector, uh, that's globally, it's the biggest one. It's about 2.2% of GDP but substantially lower for Latin America for a number of reasons. And there the drivers of this preferred scenario is investing quickly and now so that you don't have stranded assets. In terms of transport, the good policies are really about the utilization rate and uh, policies about densification of cities. And there it's about the same in Latin America and amongst other the emerging economy, about 1.3, 1.4% of GDP. For water supply and sanitation, it's really driven by the type of technology that you use. 
and in particular the willingness to engage to use low cost technology in rural areas. <clears throat> and there again, it's about the same in Latin America and the rest of the world, about half percentage of uh, point of GDP. Flood protection, um, we looked at adopting the Dutch standards and uh, accepting slightly higher risk than most than we have today from river pool flood, and it's about 0.2 percent of GDP. And then for irrigation, um, the idea that the good policy is that you subsidize the infrastructure only, not the consumption. And again, the amounts are about, about similar between Latin America and the rest of the world. So the total comes up to about 3.4% of GDP for Latin America, with the big difference with the rest of the world being driven by the energy sector. Now, what happens if instead of those, this sort of reasonable goal and, and, and good efficiency that we were talking about, you have a situation where you have uh, low ambition and high efficiency. There, the amounts are substantially lower, of course, and that adds up to about 1.8% uh, of GDP for Latin America and 2% uh, of GDP for the rest of the world. And if instead, why is this not allowing me to? And if instead you have high ambition and low efficiency, this climbs to about 8.2% of GDP globally and not much less, but about 7.8% of GDP for that. So essentially the message is whether you're in Latin America and the rest of the world, if you are not, if depending on your efficiency and depending on your uh, ambition, you will have huge differences, but it is possible to achieve very decently ambitious goals if you are efficient. And uh, yeah, just the key drivers of, uh, of high cost are energy, uh, the failure to invest in energy efficiency and the failure to adopt uh, smart uh, urban policies. Um, one point I did want to make is, even though I won't go into the details, is that of course investing in infrastructure is not enough. You need operation and maintenance and uh, the focus should always be on total life cycle cost. We have our policymakers usually far too focused on the investment Whereas we found that uh, reliable maintenance can reduce total life cycle costs of at least transport, water, and sanitation by more than 50%. So I also wanted to quickly go over a paper that we did where we were trying to look at how much countries were, or do actually spend on infrastructure because um, it's always surprising to people who don't work on infrastructure how little data there is. And you often get, I, I can't tell you how many times in my 20 years of working on this in the sector, I've been asked, so how much do countries spend on infrastructure? And there's no unique databases. So in Latin America, the IDB has a very nice database called Infra Latam, which um, really looks, and I think some of the speakers, Patricia, I think is going to look to talk a little bit about the results from that. And it's a real effort to try to collect fiscal data uh, at the level of the individual countries to try to estimate the public spending on infrastructure. We have, we're working with the IDB on an expanded uh, database to include other countries. And then of course you can use some of the IMF statistics as well as the database that we have on private participation infrastructure. None of these are perfect. They're all highly imperfect. So what we did was to try to do various combination of them to understand what might be the actual range of spending. So on average, uh, the sense is that developing countries spend around 4% of GDP, or at the time this was estimated, that was about one to 1.2 trillion on infrastructure. Um, but this is very much driven by China. And there's huge variations across regions. So in Latin America, that particular year where we were looking at it was 2.4% of GDP. Uh, which, as was mentioned before, is one of the lowest for any regions in the world. But there is a catch that one should remember, is Latin America is one of the richest, if not the richest, uh, developing region in the world. And so even though it's the smallest in terms of share of GDP, it's about, uh, it's probably one of the highest if you exclude China. Um, so it is a substantial amount of resources. But again, you know, much of the results on infrastructure is driven by China that accounts for about half of the infrastructure investment that happened in the world. 
Um, one last point I wanted to make that was an interesting finding of this paper was, was the fact that despite all the semantics about PPPs and their importance, the public sector does continue to be the primary source of finance. Um, and these numbers here show private investment, a share of total investment in infrastructure. And if you see Latin America and the Caribbean, you know, it varies between say 17 and 27 percent of GDP, depending on our on which which uh, which estimate you use. So let's agree that it's probably around a quarter of investment in infrastructure that comes from the private sector, despite all these years of, of pushing PPPs and, and hoping for PPPs to really solve the problem of low infrastructure investment. Now that's very similar to numbers that we find in emerging economies, excluding China. But of course, if you bring in China, the numbers are much lower because in fact, in China, private investment infrastructure is extremely, extremely low. How do, does the spending compare with the need? So if we believe our upper bound estimate of actual spending, it's actually pretty darn close to the needed investments, um, at least in Latin America, unlike some of the other regions. But of course, if um, here you look carefully at uh, the different uh, scenario for needs and the estimates of, of cost investments, you can see that while well, we're more or less on track to be able to respond to what we think is the preferred scenario, remember that's one of high efficiency and reasonable ambition, it's certainly not the case if, we, if our, our client countries or, or countries of Latin America don't um, are not efficient in their spending. Let me end here and I'll be happy to uh, respond to questions if any once uh, we've had the other presentations. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Marianne, for your, your presentation. You bring this issue of, about uh, the difference between public and private sector investment. I think this is a big issue in Latin America and we might uh, come to this uh, uh, in the next presentations, but also for, for the questions. I think that's a quite relevant issue in the region, mainly now that the, the pandemic has took a lot of resources uh, from infrastructure uh, to, to health, for instance. Uh, but now I would like uh, to hand over to Ms. Uh, Patricia Peya. Patricia, with you now. Good morning, everyone. Well, I'm honored to be here uh, representing the LSE Peruvian Alumni Association. It's a, we're, we're two out of three Peruvian in the panel, so this is something special for sure. Uh, I'm also a woman in, in the infrastructure industry and the panel is for women, so again. And, and as an LSE alumni, right. A bit of a spoiler, I won't mention COVID-19 in my presentation, but mainly because we are already facing problems before the pandemic, inequality and informality, just to mention two. Now, aggravated with health crisis and unprecedented economic collapse, not to mention the social protests in many cities in the region in 2019. So again, this is the context. It's, it's not gonna be easy, it's not easy now. And we need to discuss how, how we, move forward in these, in these uh, complex, very complex scenario, right? So at this point, efficient spending is more important than ever, especially if we believe, I'm underlying belief, believe infrastructure is one of the key drivers for recovery, okay? So let's get started. I've got only two messages on my presentation. One is a paradigm shift between uh, structures to services. Okay, my inspiration comes from the IDB flagship, which is called precisely infrastructure from infrastructure to services, and many papers from the World Bank, especially uh, those that, that were done by, by Marianne Fay and, and, and others. Second message is talking about services entails talking about quality infrastructure, where, where I'll be looking at four dimensions. Okay, so I'll share my presentation now. And bear with me for a second. Okay. Presentation mode. Yeah. He's up. Great. Okay, then. Okay. 
We already mentioned the fact that our region is investing very, very little infrastructure, right? At least one of the, the in, in the bottom of the of developing regions, right? But Median also also pointed out it, it, it is relative, okay? But then again, it's not a relative only because of the number itself, it's relative because the world is changing. It's moving from the era of concrete to the era of services. You see the paradigm shift we already talked about, okay? Moving on. Quality of infrastructure. Okay, when we think about quality of infrastructure, think yourself I see as a user, right? I use public transportation, I use an airport, I drink water either from the tap or I, 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 I buy purified water. So that entails within the, qualities, the, the quality concept. And again, we're lagging behind. This is a 10 year period, a very broad um, score, but still, not, not, not a good picture, okay? Let's move on to more disaggregated uh, numbers, okay? Then we have the countries, right? South America, Central America, and the Caribbean also. We, you can see with very few exceptions, right? The percentage change is small, it's small, right? And some other countries got worse, right? So what's going on at the end of the day? What's, what, what do we need to do to, you know, avoid these, these to see these graphics again. Yeah. What's, what's, what's to, what's to be done. Yeah. Okay. Moving on. This is us. Okay. Remember I told you about these four dimensions. Okay. Here they are. There are plenty more dimensions though. These are, these are not the only ones. Okay. But I choose these ones because the graphics are quite, quite uh, clear. Right. Let's take climate change, let's take affordability and connectivity. Connectivity, this is very important because you'll see the graphics and you'll be strike, okay? Then resilience and sustainable infrastructure, and finally, digital connectivity, right? I can tell you, we, we all, roughly speaking, we all know what's, what's, what's it about, but then again, I want to underline two, two aspects on this, on this particular slide. Affordability, take into account, poorest quintal cannot afford tariffs, okay? Public transportation, water, electricity, you name it. And they are the worst connected. This is not a, 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 you know, this is a fact. This is not a secret for anyone. And digital connectivity, this is absolutely critical, particularly in this context. We're lagging behind. You'll see the graphics for your, for your, for your own. Let's go, climate change. This is a bit longer period, 20 year period, right? You see in every single trans, uh, production sector I'm showing in the graphic, they're all, they're all going upwards. That's the trend, especially the land use and forestry. Not so good, we're, 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 we're not on the right path, okay? We need to change that. Let's move to affordability. Oh, if you look into Latin, into Latin America, you, you won't see it at the end. You see it at just at the beginning, after the advanced economies, how is that possible? Electricity, this is only an example about electricity, okay? So we are the second, the second most expensive, less affordable, okay? This is, this is something just uh, unacceptable, I will say. Resilient infrastructure, okay. We all hear about resilience. Resilience is not about managing disaster risk only, but mainly, okay? So we've, we've got all kinds of disasters in the region. We have got floods, El Nino, earthquakes, you name it, Nevadas, you name it, right? And this is, this is a score broad, right? But you can, you can see very few countries from, from the sample have good disaster uh, risk management scores. And that gives you an idea of, of what we're dealing with, okay? Last but not least, this is the most striking one, digital connectivity, right? Access, access is a key word. We still need to work on access in Latin America. Again, if you look at the first graphic, right? Households with weak and access to internet, you can see less of half of the sample have reached that level. 
I'm, I'm talking about the 50%. Broadband, penet mobile broadband penetration, roughly the same picture, right? If we put that in context of the, of the, of the pandemic, you have your own conclusion right there, okay? So summing up very briefly, we need to boost spending efficiency in infrastructure. That means quality. Marianne also pointed out a very, very important aspect of infrastructure and quality of infrastructure, which is maintenance. I think Antonella will touch on that also. Why is maintenance important? Because my, the infrastructure couldn't be sustainable if governments do not properly plan and prepare projects, regardless of implementation method, regardless of that, if they don't proper plan and prepare projects for the whole life cycle, the whole project life cycle. This is very important, okay? We need to close the access gap. I would love, I will dream about seeing someone talking about in, in this same scenario, say LSE or outside LSE in five year time and say Latin America already closed the access gap. Just access, okay? I think we can do it. Finally, but very, very important, I will say is key, recognizing that good governance and transparency throughout the project life cycle are key. So what's good governance? This is a really fancy phrase. Okay, governance is about having the institutional setting in place. Okay, institutional setting meaning having institutions accountable and not people that are accountable. No, institutions that are accountable, right? The trust, the, the citizens trust in their institutions, right? And obviously setting the right goals, okay? As, as Marianne said before, setting the right goals is absolutely key, right? But if you don't have the proper planning system in a country, then you won't make it, okay? At, le at least not in a sustainable way. Transparency, just to wrap up, transparency is not only about fighting corruption, okay? Transparency is about giving the access to citizens to what you're doing with their money, basically, and what you, what you can do to improve their lives, okay? Well, that's me, and uh, thanks, thanks for listening, thanks for your attention, pleasure. Thank you very much, Patricia. I think uh, you, you, you touched on two, two important points that I think we will follow up on the discussion, which is about the quality of, uh, of infrastructure and also about the access gap. We, in our region, that is a dramatic issue and that poses even more pressure when thinking about investing in infrastructure because we always need to take into account how to reach the people who need more, uh, the poor people. And sometimes when you are thinking about bringing the private investment, uh, you need to balance how to uh, reconcile the private sector interests for profits, but also with the social goals that uh, we, we need to take in, into account. But we will come more with this later. But now I would like to hand to Antonella Bancalari. Antonella, welcome. Thank you very much, everybody, for organizing such an important event and for this super relevant topic for the region. Um, and, and now I'm going to shift a little bit the discussion from the macro part towards the evidence that we have at the micro level. And well, from Marianne's presentation, we have learned that, um, actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share my PowerPoint now. Um, we, know, we know from Marianne's presentation that we are hitting the trillion dollar per year expenditure in the in the whole world and particularly in the region so now now it's important to start thinking about what are the consequences of investing in infrastructure not only once projects are completed and used but throughout the whole life cycle and for this i'm i'm, I'm giving a title to my presentation of the importance of evidence-based policy making and I'll present kind of uh, um, a brief summary of what we know so far. So let's, let's step back and, 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 and think, okay, why are we discussing about infrastructure? What do we know about 
the actual uh, uh, effect of infrastructure on our living standards. So what we know is, for example, irrigation dams can increase agricultural productivity and can decrease weather vulnerability and poverty in downstream areas. We know also that electricity networks are great in promoting uh, uh, um, female uh, employment, female labor participation, and increasing male earnings. It promotes productivity. It, in, it improves the, 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 um, the living standards in terms of the human development index, such as education and income, and it increases wealth through housing value. And we also know that transportation infrastructure overall promotes economic development. So there's evidence that roads increase GDP per capita, labor mobility of agricultural workers and employment. And railroads decrease trade costs and interregional price gaps, increase interregional and international trade, and increase real income. What we know from advanced economies in the previous centuries is also the fact that water and sewerage infrastructure improve dramatically public health and decrease early life mortality. But what we don't know is what made these projects success, successful in the first place. So all these projects that I'm talking about, all this evidence comes from those projects that are already completed and in use. But we have relatively neglected all the implementation phase. So what do we know about the consequences of allocation of projects, the construction phase, and the completion of projects? So I'm gonna call these first three steps the implementation phase, and I'm gonna talk about that. Then I'm gonna talk about promoting demand, which is basically this part here that is connection and use of the infrastructure. And then I'm gonna talk about the supply side, so the quality of infrastructure throughout the life cycle, the final stage of the life cycle, which is the operation and maintenance. So in terms of project implementation, we know that there's very frequent inefficient allocation of projects, in a, in a spatial manner. So we tend to favor coastal areas with greater environmental risks. And we also tend to favor and give more projects to areas that not necessarily give the greatest uh, economic and social returns. And this is just because, for example, of political favoritism. Another aspect that we have neglected is the fact that white elephants are largely prevalent. Mid-construction abandoned infrastructure are a common site in lots of cities of Latin America and elsewhere in different regions of the world. And this is accompanied by, by the fact that, well, they will never be completed, but by temporary delays caused by cost overruns, poor technical design, corruption, et cetera, et cetera. So my research uh, is focusing on which are the consequences of these white elephants. And I particularly ask the question, can white elephants kill? And what I do is I estimate the effect of unfinished sewerage projects on early life mortality in Peru. There was a nationwide expansion of the sewerage network, the, sanita the sanitary sewerage network in Peru between 2005 and 2015 with the aim of improving uh, public health and decreasing early life mortality. But in reality, there's really large mid-construction abandonment. So white elephants are, are, are everywhere. And what you can see in this graph is the distribution of the years that sewerage projects were abandoned. Um, on the gray area, you see what happens for all the oldest projects. So those that were started between 2005 and 2012. 80% of these projects were a white elephant at some point, at least one year. And then what you can see is that although newer projects seems to have been suffering less from the construction abandonment, one could argue that it's just a matter of time until the distribution shifts and these projects start being abandoned one, two, three, four, five years or indefinitely. By 2015, around 30% of the sewerage projects were not completed. And if these projects are never to be completed, a back of the envelope calculation suggests that the total uh, public expenditure on these mid-constructed mid projects would be equivalent to one third of the tertiary education expenditure in Peru in 2015. So there's a really large uh, um, uh, opportunity, social opportunity cost of these funds. And of course, this wasteful use of public resources is worrisome. But it's even more disconcerting the fact that these white elephants can kill. And what I, I'm showing you here 
is a coefficient plot of the, of the estimated effect of an additional unfinished project on under five mortality measured at deaths per thousand children. And what I find is that with every additional unfinished project in a district in Peru, the mortality of children under the age of five caused by waterborne diseases and accidents increase. And this is related to the fact that uh, in order to install public sewers, excavation works are needed, which leaves open ditches that get filled with stagnant water and can become pools of infection. And the excavation works also divert traffic chaotically into previously quiet residential areas where children were used to roam freely, and that generates accidents. Um, in order to install public sewers, water cuts are also needed which forces the population to rely on unsafe sources of water and affect their, their water and sanitation practices, something so important right now in the pandemic. And finally, in extreme cases, children have drowned in these open ditches that were as deep as two meters and got filled with nearby uh, sources of water. Okay, so bottom line, we definitely need to guarantee project completion. There are very high social costs of leaving infrastructure projects unfinished. And there's evidence that adequate managerial practices such as providing uh, financial rewards to local bureaucrats increase the, 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 the probability of completing a project. There's also a need to overcome unstable local political dynamics. And for this, an inter, uh, there, there's a need for an intergovernmental transfer rule that conditions any transfer that comes from the central government to the local government on completing any started project before starting a new one. So that way we won't have half-built schools, half-built health centers, half-built infrastructure. We'll make sure that projects that are started are completed before starting a new one. And there's also evidence that a heavier regulation of procurement is needed in, is needed in order to have better outcomes in these infrastructure projects. Okay, so what happens after project completion? Well, we still need to run the last mile, which is basically we need to promote demand. And what we have seen in the region is that demand is not always ensured. There's very low demand for this infrastructure. Um, this is called the last mile problem, and it's basically the inability of governments to connect the final user to the expensive infrastructure. Um, and this is this uh, two reasons for this. Why this happened is is basically low ability to pay, and this is linked to affordability on what what Patricia was talking about, but also very low willingness to pay. So maybe we can do something about these two angles. So how to promote demand? Um, there's evidence that information and sensitization campaigns can be effective at uh, promoting uh, the adoption of infrastructure. And there's also a need for demand side subsidies that can release liquidity constraints, for example, for households to connect, to connect to digital technology, to connect to public sewers. There, there's a need for an investment at the household level. And there's also evidence that conditional cash transfers in Mexico, in Colombia, and also in Peru have uh, increased the adoption, the demand, the usage of school infrastructure services and, and healthcare services. But this willingness to pay can also be because of the terrible supply. <laughs> very, uh, people are, have very low willingness to pay for an infrastructure of low quality. Well, that's not surprising. And this is linked to the very poor operation and maintenance. So this is the final stage in the life cycle of infrastructure. And what we see is infrastructure of degrading status, intermittent supply, for example, water for just a few hours per day, or insufficient supply. There's just not enough. So how to upgrade supply? This is a growing research agenda, but what we know so far is that, for example, privatization improved the supply of water and sewer services in Argentina, but it was not the case in Colombia. So we still need to understand what's the best role for the private sector um, when improving services. There's also a need to remove supply side subsidies that generate distortions. In Colombia, for example, it was found that all the supply side subsidies were going to the most inefficient providers. And there's also a need to promote demand if we want to make sure that infrastructure is, uh, the, the operation and maintenance of the infrastructure is sustained over time. So um, thank you very much. And all the references of all the papers that I've mentioned are in the presentation, which is gonna become available afterwards. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Antonella, for, for bringing uh, robust evidence for the discussion. It's very nice to see this connecting research. I think we are the LSE and we like that. So uh, thank you very much. And so let's start now uh, with some uh, questions. And uh, let me get them here. So uh, I would like uh, first to bring a question uh, to Patricia. Uh, Jorge Martinez uh, from the National Infrastructure Fund of the Ministry of Finance in Mexico. He asks you, uh, why do you underline as a belief the importance of infrastructure investment? Oh, okay. Uh, I said it in a, uh, uh, you know, uh, okay. Belief is because if we be really believe the construction sector can, can play a role in recovery, that's, that's basically what, what I want to, wanted to imply, Jorge, okay? Um, for a few months now, it's been discussed that infrastructure will and is a key driver for recovery. I want, and, and pay attention, I'm not saying economic recovery, social and economic recovery, okay? And it, it could bring job creation and social economic development and so on and so forth, only and only if we take into account these ingredients we, we all of all of us mentioned sustainability uh, you know carbon emission and these governance and uh, aspects of of the whole infrastructure um industry okay and how can so so i think uh, it's it's ironic in a way because if if you think about it before the before the COVID nineteen, we were the same, right? And what what has changed? What has changed in you know in 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 the bureaucrats? What has changed in 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 users? What has changed? Lots of things have changed, probably for the worst. Okay, but what we need to do is exactly find the opportunities that were before the pandemic. Okay, find in those opportunities the best way of, the, of putting on the table the solutions that could be, could, could, could be carried out, basically. So that's, that's, what, that's why I'm saying, if we believe, right? If we believing implies all of that, I think, right? Political, political willingness, um, people wanting to pay, but wanting to pay for what, okay? And all the, social and economic scenario that brings the these new context to to the region basically right so i think we we've we've got a very very big opportunity but if we miss it now then we're gonna regret it because this is not the only crisis will come i think the climate change is the next crisis we're gonna face and quite soon so we need to be prepared now and and, and not not after okay thanks Jorge sorry I, I was uh, that was long thank you Patricia I would like now to to take a question uh, from Professor Gary Jones from the LSC to Marianne Marianne uh, could you identify uh, particular finance mechanisms that would best fit the efficiency criteria set out in the presentation um. So, uh, on on the public finance side, so so let me not you know there's there's plenty to be said on the on 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 the PPB side, and I think Patricia would be a much better placed person to answer on that. Um, on the on the public side, you know I think there's a couple of things that we we as an institution don't pay enough attention to, and one is is really just public sector spending efficiency, uh, starting with procurement. I mean, there's massive, uh, look, the region has been devastated by the Lava Jato scandal, the Pollo Blancos and so on and so forth, right? So, so working on, on the procurement systems, using big data, using you know, all the information we can to really do better, but without paralyzing the system. Here in Peru, what we're seeing, and again, Patricia is very well placed to talk about this, is Contraloria has taken on an oversized role and everybody is absolutely 
you cannot find a civil servant who will sign anything because they're worried about ending in, up in jail. So you have complete paralysis. So, so finding that middle road where you can have efficient controls and you can gain all this amazing efficiency that, 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 that the potential efficiency gain that exists, um, I think would be really critical. Um, a couple of other things have come up uh, that are very interesting. One is, is competition policy in the construction industry. So it's really the flip side of that, that uh, corruption, that um, uh, procurement side. Um, you know, even things like cement, those tend to be very uncompetitive industries and, and we have the elements to look at that. So huge gains can be done there. And then uh, I have one more point and it's uh, escaping me. Oh, there's some really new interesting methodologies in the construction industry. There's this thing called BIM, uh, Building Information Management, where you essentially, um, essentially try to get everything in a single database, uh, you know, where you, that every, every person who intervenes on the, on the building site will have access to similar information. It, it's quite sophisticated. It started in the UK. I think the UK is the one who's been the biggest proponent. And uh, where it's implemented on complex projects, it seems to have really yielded some, some, uh, some, uh, some really important benefits. So, it, you know, we always, we tend to overestimate corruption and, and malfeasance and underestimate pure incompetence and pure sort of mix-ups. And I think it's really important to remind ourselves that you need to address both. Excellent, thank you very much, Marian. Now I'm going to take uh, to Antonella. Uh, actually, I will take two that I think they, they connect to, to each other. Uh, Marcelo Leonardi mentions that subsiding consumption of public goods like water and electric electricity in the standard economic theory is inefficient because it promotes overconsumption of the good. Wouldn't it, be more, wouldn't it be more efficient to supplement incomes of poorer members of society uh, via general transfers and let them choose how to spend that income, whether on electricity, water, or other public goods, such as education, private consumption, uh, etc. And there is also another one to you uh, that does the statement about removing supply side subsidies in Colombia apply to all infrastructure sectors or to anyone in particular? Thank you very much. Really important questions. Um, so, so I'm going to talk about what's there in terms of evidence um, that I feel confident uh, to make reference to. So first of all, in terms of the demand, the demand side subsidies, I, I, I completely agree that demand side subsidies are not sustainable over time and that as any subsidy and will know, it creates traps and distortions in the economy. Um, however, there, there, are, there, are, there is evidence that a demand side subsidy, a one off demand side subsidy for building a toilet or connecting to a public sewer uh, actually were very effective at changing sanitation practices such as open defecation that were very dangerous for public health. But now, in terms of continuous, like let's say, um, um, a fees that you have to pay over time for services, I do think that the best solution and what the evidence tells us is that cash transfers work way better. Now, if they are conditional or not, there's a lot of evidence that conditional cash transfer has been uh, a great, not only in, uh, in, in the current generation, but even having intergenerational effects on, on the adoption of services and, and overall human capital and development. But there's, there's a growing literature showing that even if you don't condition them, which is very difficult to target, to condition, to enforce, so even if you don't do that and you just provide uh, um, um, cash transfers, there's also an increase in the demand. So, so, so people are not just eating these or spending it in alcohol and things that are not good for the health, but there's actually a demand for things that are good uh, and beneficial. And in this case, uh, I think it could work. You can try earmarking for, okay, this transfer is for you to pay your fees for the community toilet, for example, for people that do not have access to to private toilets, or this is the fees for you to pay for your electricity bill. You can earmark them, and it has been shown that just earmark them and, and not even enforcing them have a, um, um, a great effect. Or you can just make them unconditional, and, and, and I think that could work as well. Um, but yeah, we need, we need more evidence, mostly from the region, because we have a lot of evidence from Asia and, and Africa. 
uh, on, on unconditional cash transfers. So, so in terms of the supply side subsidies, so, so what I meant is that there's a need to remove supply side subsidies that are generating distortions. So not all supply side sub subsidies are bad, it's just the inefficient allocation of these subsidies. And the particular case I'm referring to is large subsidies that uh, um, um, were basically having precarious distribution network uh, uh, supplying users of electricity that were never paying for them. And basically what happens is that these existing subsidies are providing greater transfers to areas with unreliable supply, which is deterring investment to modernize infrastructure. So this is basically a supply side subsidy trap. So, so, so it's not like, like clear, let's not have supply side subsidies. Something is, something is needed to give this push to improve the infrastructure. Um, um, but you have to be careful with the, with, the, with the trap that you may fall. And at least my research that I'm, I'm citing here as Arman et al. in India, it shows that a one-off push of the supply, so providing one-off uh, supply side subsidy can backfire by the fact that then the demand is shifted. So the demand now is, is, is not willing to privately contribute and expect much more subsidies even when they are not demand side subsidies. So I think this is all like, like, like growing, a growing research agenda. Um, and I hope there's more evidence from, from the Latin American region. Thank you very much, Antonella. I would like also to mention uh, before uh, uh, coming with more questions, uh, Beatrice Flora, uh, which she is uh, co-president of the African Public Private Partnerships Network. Uh, she says that a pleasure to be here and a great insightful discussions, especially in infrastructure space. The discussions resonate with what is happening in Africa as well. I think this is very nice, uh, Beatrice mentioned about Africa because in, in some aspects there are a lot in common uh, with our reality in, in Latin America. I would like now to uh, ask to a uh, question to Marianne again, uh, a question from Mark Mosley of the Mosley Infrastructure Advisory Service. Mark uh, was also the Chief Operating Officer of the GI Hub. We, do, we, we did a very important work in, G, in, in the J-Hub. Uh, he asks you, if we need a Latin America equivalent of the digital moonshot for Africa initiative. Okay, that's, that's a great point. Uh, in fact, you know, one of the things that COVID has revealed is how backwards Latin America is in terms of digital access. And, you know, we, I have a, a new boss who was previously working in, in Kenya and other countries, and he comes in, you know, with the experience of M-Pesa and digital money. And, and here we are having people waiting in line in Peru to try to get their, their bonos uh, and getting infected. Uh, there's very little use, uh, you know, how many millions of kids are not able to have access to uh, to uh, education because there's, you know, low access to, uh, to, um, uh, to the internet or they don't have, you know, uh, the equipment needed. So, um, and, you know, if you look, for example, at a lot of the new thinking on access to uh, energy, for example, it's highly dependent on very sophisticated digital uh, you know, data and management and so on and so forth and smart networks and all of these things. So, you know, uh, to me, the biggest priority in infrastructure in Latin America today is to get the region up to speed on digital issues. Now, some of it, um, I'm not an expert, but my understanding is that some of it is, is physical. It's the actual infrastructure. A lot of it is regulatory uh, and that there's a lot of dark fibers that could be lit up. There's a lot of regulatory issues that could be done to bring, particularly in, in the development of the services that we need, you know, be it digital banking or smart uh, networks and so on and so forth. So I, I really hope this is something that, um, that could be one of the positive consequences of COVID is the realization in Latin America of the need to having its own digital moonshot. Thank you very much, uh, Marian. Now I would like uh, to bring a questions to, uh, to Patricia. Uh, 
let me just uh, got it here um, from uh, Paloma Salas, LSC alumni from Mexico. Uh, she uh, make a questions for all, but I would like to bring to you, Patricia, because I know you work a, a lot with uh, PPPs. And she asked how to foster private sector participation in these times of uncertainty. Are the risks just too high in the current situation? Well, nothing has stopped Paloma, first of all, okay? Countries are still working on their pipelines, uh, on, the, on their PPP pipelines, I, I, I mean. They're just, what they did or they're doing is prioritizing the pipelines, okay? So basically, the investors are, are there, right? The investors, obviously, they, they, they are, they're weakened because because of the of the operational of the operational uh, shocks, right? And especially if they're new in the market, they're, they're weakened obviously. And and we barely stopped the machine for seven eight months in a row, right? So this is not a minor a minor shock, right? But I can tell you, regardless of the uncertainty, countries in Latam still working on the pipelines and. That's in the in the in the you know in the in the implement in the pre-implementation phase. If we want to move to the implementation phase, then what we have is obviously some sectors that are struggling more than others. Say transportation, for instance, for obvious reasons, so where you have roads and airports and so on, right? But then, although another thing that is going on at this point is regardless of the face of the of the of the ppp right either it is pre pre-construction construction or operational phase what countries are doing is they're working on the recovery reports they're working on the recovery recovery strategies okay um most of the countries because of the economic shock of the pandemic they're very careful about giving subsidies or giving you know uh, money money to to investors for obvious reasons right and what they, what they're looking at now is like a like an agenda like a una hoja de ruta say for driving these problems to a very healthy end okay obviously complying with the legal framework complying with the contracts but being flexible also because these are long-term projects, as you will know, Paloma. So that's, that's my answer. Sorry, I, I, that was long. Thank you very much, Patricia. Now we'll turn uh, one more time to Antonella. Adriana Lombardini, uh, she says she worked in a local connectivity for rural communities. Uh, and she said they, they have documented ev evidence of the need for different kinds of communications infrastructure in subsistence economies where global infrastructures and operators are not fit for purpose. Instead, local internet providers, community networks, we don't know innovative low cost networks are proving substantial, uh, sustainable, but governments and regulators still don't recognize that SMEs may be more efficient to meet rural needs. What's your opinion about this? Uh, will international banks finance small operators and community networks in interest in providing broadband? That's a very interesting point. And in fact, um, there's more and more research on local solutions. Um, I think that we can fall into uh, a, a trap again if we as a government want to centralize everything and provide everything centralized. So, so like you're, you're talking about the example of uh, digital connectivity. Marianne was also talking about it, how important it is. Um, and, 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 and it not only happens with um, um, at that, but also the traditional infrastructure such as sewerage and everything has to be sewerage and managed by the central government. However, there is evidence that community-based solutions can be quite effective because they may not be suffering from lots of the inefficiencies and the bureaucracies uh, that, that the government may be suffering from. Um, I don't know if international banks will start financing small operation and community networks. I hope so. Um, and perhaps Marianne can say a bit more about that if the, if the World Bank is financing these types of projects. I know that there is um, a, a move towards 
research towards that and impact evaluations on these solutions, but I hope that if they are proven to be in a, in a, in a systematic way to be a good solution, I can imagine that resources will be uh, diverted towards these types of projects. Thank you very much, Antonella. We are uh, reaching our time here, but I would like to do a last round of questions uh, we, you three uh, before we finish. So I'm going to actually take two questions to Marianne. Um, uh, Vitor Xavier, uh, LSC alumni, MC Regulation 2018 from Brazil. Uh, she asks, uh, to what extent should we foster regional cooperation and integration in order to achieve a better outcomes in infrastructure investment in Latin America. And Adrian Fossa Seca, uh, MPA candidate at the LSE from Venezuela, uh, he asks if you could please highlight a Latin American country that has exceptionally tried to increase infrastructure spending up to those levels recommended by the World Bank. All right, uh, on the first question, you know, I remember some colleagues of mine did a very nice report on energy in Latin America a couple of years ago. And they had this statement that has stuck to my mind about how, you know, the, the cables have been built across border, but the electrons are not flowing, right? And it's, it's, it's really amazing that particularly on the, uh, particularly on the energy side, as we're going towards more renewable energy and, you know, it's, uh, Renewable energy systems are much more reliable if you can cover a much wider share of, of diverse climate, right? Uh, uh, Denmark can have whatever 50 or 60 percent of its energy from, uh, from uh, wind because it's part of the European power pool, right? So I think Latin America absolutely could gain enormous uh, reliable advantages in terms of reliability and efficiency if it can be better integrated and and there the issues are really political uh, a lack of trust between countries and, uh, and and I hope that this is something that can be addressed it's particularly true in energy as I said but also in transport where not every country needs to have its own major port um, connectivity between countries leaves to be desired uh, and so on and so forth. So I, that's a very good point. Um, the second question about which country is spending at the levels, uh, uh, you know, the recommended by the bank, we do not recommend a particular level of spending. We really, really don't, right? Again, you know, you ask me how much I should spend on my children's education, I'm going to explain to you what type of education I want them to get and uh, how I'm going to shop around. If you ask me how much I want to spend on, on building a house, I'll discuss what type of house do I want to mention or do I want a, a, a little weekend cabin. So that's a political decision at the level of a country, what they want to spend on, what their goals are, where I think we need to be much more active, all of us and all of you present, I think need to be much more active, much more vocal on pushing for the efficiency, which, which really is the technical side where we need to come in. Now, my understanding is that some countries are more efficient than others, um, but I think all of Latin America could do better in improving its efficiency and transparency. Excellent, thank you very much again, uh, Marianne. Now I would like to take a final questions to Patricia from Victoria uh, Frey Sr. Do you think it's really necessary to regulate the adoption of better practices to design, develop, and deliver sustainable infrastructure? But in other countries, that is not necessary. It's just the volunteer to deliver good results to the taxpayer talking about public infrastructure. Right, right. Can you tell me the name, Carlos, again, of the person? Victoria. Victoria. Okay, Victoria. Yes, I think it's necessary for at least one or two reasons. Because Latin America, we still have to work on our institutional capacity. Okay, so although we're a broad region, right, we've got our own differences between the Caribbean, South, and Central America. But just to give you an example, we, we already said, and Marianne already made a brilliant point, setting the right goals is essential. How do you set 
the right goal, right? By having a complete and very deep diagnosis of your needs, right? How do you do that? Okay, you plan, you prepare, you plan, right? You formulate a project, regardless of how, how it is implemented. How do you plan if there is no institution that deals with planning in a country? I won't say names though. How do you do that? Oh no, we have lots of institutions. Oh, right, okay, so you have, I don't know, five or six institutions at the national level, say there's six ministries or seven ministries, obviously there's, typically there's more, and all the subnationals, um, subnational entities also they plan their own their own agendas for say bbp say public works whatever right do you think in this scenario you'll be setting the right goals right so there you have your answer i think um so that's that's one thing that's uh, and antonella and median already touched that throughout the project life cycle that's the very, very beginning, the genesis, right? As in Spanish, very, very beginning of, of the story. If we don't do that, or if we do it in a very weak way, right? Say, for example, we're doing the budgeting, okay? All we do is we want to implement lots of projects. Well, we're not taking into account the budget for maintenance, for example. I'm not talking about PPPs, I'm talking about public works, for example, or project, uh, obras, uh, obras por impuestos, or any, any other projects you, you, you're thinking about, or a mix of that, concessions, say, in Brazil, for example, Brazil or Chile, okay? So imagine if that happens in early stage, what could happen next? What could happen in, 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 you know, in later stages when you have, okay, you sign the contract, but suddenly no one, cares about maintenance and no one deal about, dealt about not only the, the finance of maintenance, but if that institution that will deal with the maintenance in the operational maintenance phase have the capacity to do that, all right? Um, yeah, and we, we could talk about PPPs, but then, but then again, I, 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 won't, I won't monopolize the discussion for that. So on, on PPPs, I mean. So yeah, my, my, my answer is yes, we're not ready. We're not ready for, for what you uh, propose on your, on your um, question. I wish we could be one day, but then and again, governance and transparency and accountability, which we haven't mentioned so far at, at, at the presentation, is absolutely key, critical points in Latin America. And I will, I will say we, we are still weak. On, on that particular issues. Okay, that's, I stop there. Thank you very much, Patricia. And now I'll turn to the last question uh, to Antonella. Andres Baquero, uh, he says, how much do you think that some of their regulatory red tape to allow infrastructure innovations come from the need to create a workable regulatory framework to attract private investors into providing infrastructure? If this is so, uh, how can we update or improve regulation in such a way that we will not scare off private sector from making the huge investments that countries need or that governments want? Yes, um, I partially replied to that question already in the chat. And I think, um, so, so in terms of regulatory, heavy regulatory of procurement is actually associated with better outcomes but in countries with lower quality public sectors. And this is linked to what Patricia was saying before, that we still need to develop institutions. We're not there yet, and regulation is still needed. Um, what happens and what evidence shows is that afterwards, when, the, when, when, when countries develop and it has a higher human capital index, this association is actually negative. So heavier regulation procurement is associated with worse outcomes. Uh, in line with what you are saying in your question, it can, it can become a constraint after some point. So it's very tricky, but we need to kind of find that sweet spot in which once we are, once we have, as, as Marianne was saying, right, like a very competitive procurement process, she was talking about in cement, we don't even have a good competition. So once we're there and once we have 
the, the necessary competition in different uh, providers that the government uses, maybe regulations can start relaxing a little bit to not act as constraints. Thank you very much, Antonella. Uh, so for concluding this event, uh, so ladies and gentlemen, it's been a great pleasure to have the opportunity for both me and I think for all of you to listen to Marianne Fay, Patricia Pelli and Antonella Bancalari. Uh, thank you very much to our guest speakers and thank you very much to the audience for taking part. We are most grateful uh, you could find time in your busy schedule to be with us today. Thank you also for your thoughtful questions. I think this discussion about infrastructure in Latin America and in the different parts of the world is definitely on the agenda. Uh, there's a lot of discuss, uh, discussion also about uh, increasing uh, public, public sector investment now in infrastructure. Uh, but uh, we, we, so we basically have the, the two sides of the discussion that uh, government has no money have no money, so I need to bring the private sector. And we know the private sector will not do it alone. Uh, as Marianne uh, showed in her presentation in the beginning, uh, the public sector accounts in most parts of the world for uh, uh, the most relevant share of the investment. So uh, I think uh, that leads to the discussion that was the aim of this uh, uh, event, that how we spend better how we improve efficiency, how we improve quality. And there is a lot to discuss about the proper incentives, the design mechanisms, and, and then the kind of contracts like PPPs uh, appear as good alternatives, but it ha auto also has its problems. And uh, to uh, finalize, we haven't, uh, we usually when we discuss infrastructure, we discussed the big sectors like telecom, energy, uh, ICT, uh, roads, airports, ports, but a lot of efficiency and quality to really reduce the access gap that Pat Patricia mentioned uh, deals also with uh, providing social infrastructure and healthcare, education, public housing, and uh, in, in, particularly for Latin America, this is crucial. And sometimes we simply don't discuss this as we should. And this is uh, uh, certainly avenues that we could improve public spending. So uh, thank you very much to everyone. And finally, thanks also for the LSC Latin American Caribbean Center and to all uh, uh, Latin America alumni associations. I think we, 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 we should mention that we, we, we came as a, a strong group and a very quality and top event. So I think this should be stressed by, uh, to us, uh, to our alumni associations doing a great job. I also thank uh, Colum our Columbia friends for supporting this event. So it's an amazing event discussing a very relevant topic for the region and worldwide. So thank you very much and see you in our next LSE event. Take care of yourself.